Welcome to Catalog and Cocktails. This is episode six. You've got Tim Gasper here, director of product at Data.World, and uh, Juan uh, Cicada, our uh, principal scientist. Hey, Tim, how are you doing? Doing pretty good. How are you doing today? Great. Well, I'm excited always. This is my the mid of the week uh, uh, kind of our break, and I really enjoy this. And I'm actually looking very quickly here at the list of participants. I'm seeing a lot of new names. This is pretty cool. Yeah, welcome everyone. Yeah. Really excited to have you here. Catalog and Cocktails is where we get together. Uh, uh, Juan and I, we, we, we have some topic du jour. We talk about data. We usually have drinks of some kind in hand, and we'll talk a little bit about what drinks we have today. But, um, you know, go ahead and check out the chat. We'll be watching the chat throughout the, throughout the conversation. Um, and uh, ask any questions and uh, let us know what you're drinking. And uh, Juan, what are you drinking? Well, I actually did make a drink today and not, not just beer or, or, or liquor. Um, I don't know. I was looking at what I had in my, what I had in my, in, in my, uh, in my bar. And this is like a, this is a vodka martini with some orange bitters and a little bit of, and an orange in there. And I kind of squeeze a little bit of orange. It's okay. Well, not the, nice. way, not the best thing. But kind of good. Anyway. Yeah. How's, how's, how strong is the orange flavor? Is it pretty strong or? Well, depends how much orange you want to go squeeze. I didn't squeeze that much into it. It's more of the color than anything else. So cheers. What are you nice. drinking? Cool. Cheers. I got um, uh, some local uh, Garrison Brothers uh, whiskey um, uh, from High, Texas. So pretty close by to Austin. Yeah, Texas is starting to get a lot of more different type of beverages. That's pretty cool. So uh, what vodka I'm drinking, that is, uh, um, it's not Grey Goose. It's the other one that I have. Belvedere. That's the one I have at home. Uh, so, hey, for folks around, can you just, if you want, uh, share in the chat where, where you're coming from and what are you drinking? And, uh, and as we mentioned, like, we like to keep this first 30 minutes. Uh, we'll, we're recording. We're having, Tim and I will have a conversation. And then after 30 minutes, we'll stop recording. And then uh, you, we'll, we'll open up the mics and we can just have a conversation. And just note that we're recording. So if, you're, if you have your camera on, it's fine, but you're being, you're being recorded. So, <laughs> so um yeah, so where have we where have we been? <laughs> let's let's do a quick recap. Yeah, we we've uh, we've had quite a few episodes now at this point. We're on episode six. We've had uh, five episodes before this, and yeah, we've covered a lot of ground. So we you know we talked about sort of uh, a lot of the data problems that people face, you know, um, and and we kind of started to look at some different types of personas, some personas that are more on sort of the data producer side. So you're sort of your engineers and your admins and your sort of caretakers for different systems versus sort of more the data consumers, right? So people who are, um, you know, your analysts or your scientists or even just sort of your knowledge workers who need to, you know, download that Excel file every day or every week or whatever that might be, right? Um, and then we also talked a little bit about a bridging kind of person, somebody who kind of bridges those two worlds and helps kind of be a, a steward across of the, all those, right? And we all know that there's this concept of a data steward who is a kind of a, a, a relatively well-known um, sort of pseudo title uh, for people in the job that they do and, and kind of caretaking for this stuff. But we also introduced uh, data product manager as well as knowledge scientist as some sort of different ways to look at this as, as people who are really bridging those two worlds, the sort of the technical and the business and really helping to um, sort of productize uh, high value curated, high quality um, data products and data assets. Um, and we talked about features as well, right? We talked about things like data catalogs having uh, business glossaries and lineage and search and, you know, a uh, uh, quick teaser next week, we'll be uh, talking about lineage uh, uh, more specifically um, search, um, you know, people and how people are really the center of everything. Um, I don't know. Would you add anything to that one? No, I, I think that really recaps it. And, but in, in, on all the features and stuff. Now, one of the things that that we do at data.world in general. Sorry, by the way, I, I'm sitting outside and I got chickens. My chickens just kind of walked up on, on the table. <laughs> but anyway, so one of the things that, that we have at data.world that we say is that we're a data catalog powered by a knowledge graph. And this is something that is kind of a, becoming more of a hot topic about what knowledge graphs and, and what does it mean for a data catalog, data catalog to be powered by a knowledge graph? Why should it be powered by a knowledge graph? Why should you care? And what even is a knowledge graph, right? So I think that was kind of what we wanted to discuss today uh, to kind of kick, kick that start, kick, uh, kick, kick this discussion. So um, 
just kind of get a little bit back of, of context. So this term knowledge graph is a term that got popularized around uh, 2012 by, by Google. Uh, they, they came up with this blog post about, uh, about introducing knowledge graph, which is basically, they called it strings, not things. Essentially, in my kind of my definition of a knowledge graph is you want to one, your goal is to do data, you're integrating data, you want to do data integration. And second, you want that your real world business concepts and your real world business relationships are part of that data that's being integrated. They're first class citizens. And when you start combining, you say, I want to go integrate data and I want my, my concepts and my relationships to be first class citizens. That's basically a, a knowledge graph. And it happens that you start the, the data model you're representing all this information happens to be in a graph. So that's why it, it's the knowledge graph aspect. And what, what, we, what we do is that we're able to accomplish linking metadata and data together. So data and metadata become one same thing that you can go access and go query and represent. And it happens to be that all this is represented as a form of a graph. So that is kind of my, what I always call my presentations, that's Juan's definition, non-scientific, non-pedantic and inclusive definition of what a knowledge graph is. So it's data integration plus real world business concepts and relationships are your first class citizens. Um, now, naturally you have all these technologies to go represent, uh, create knowledge graphs. And then you go into the, 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 the two different type of, of, of kind of camps, like it's just the semantic web type of camp with RDF, or is this the property graph camp? At the end of the day, it's all a graph. There are reasons why you want to do one or the other, but for now, this is focused that you're thinking about uh, the model of a graph. And I think graphs are really, really important for data integration because if I imagine I take two data sets that are represented as a graph and they're separated, how do I take two separated graphs and turn them into one? I just start adding edges like relationships between the nodes and the graph. Then these two things that were separated start getting connected. So data integration is by definition, basically a graph problem. It's finding connections between all these different nodes in your graph. So I think that, that, that has always been kind of the realization of, 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 why, of why you wanna be able to use graphs as a, as a very flexible data model. Uh, but obviously kind of for the last 20 plus years, a relational model has been the most, the most important kind of the, the dominant model in industry, but we're now starting to see this rise again of graphs. And it's just what comes around goes around. And what I tell people, guess what was the first database that ever was out there in, in, in back in the 60s? It was a graph database. Network databases were graph databases. Like, I mean, hierarchical databases were these trees, right? So that's where this all comes from. And then afterwards, the relational model came in. So that's how we see the world is that graphs are coming back uh, and they've had a couple of iterations, but now the technology has really stepped up after so many years of, of, of us working on it. So that's how that, that, that's my, my uh, quick definition of what is a knowledge graph. What, what, do, what do you think, uh, Tim, based on everything you've seen? No, I, I agree with that. And uh, I know you're going to go more into this, but you know, I like that. Um, that when we think about knowledge graphs and we think about what sort of information you want to put in a knowledge graph, I think that you usually people seem to be kind of thinking in two directions, right? They think about more like um, property graph type problems, right? More like, uh, you know, information that makes sense to display in a graph. Like, uh, you know, if you have a bunch of, uh, you know, locations and, and those locations are connected to each other in some way, like cell towers and things like that, right? People think about like, um, you know, fraud and, and, and fraud detection use cases and things like that. But then, you know, the other kind of set of, of use cases seems to revolve more around sort of the semantics around information, right? Um, and I think especially in that use case, when we talk about metadata, we talk about data about our data, um, it seems like um, in general, knowledge graphs and graph databases are sort of the perfect representation for that, right? Because you've got sort of the underlying data itself kind of represented by tables and columns and dashboards and things like that. And then you have a layer of data about those different things. And then on top of that, you know, data.world, for example, we're not trying to be the one-stop shop for all your data collection, right? Because sometimes you're using other tools, right? You're using things like maybe Manta for lineage, or you're using some data quality tool, or you're using all these different things. Um, and you wanna bring that all together into a common repository 
right? It isn't always so easy to just be like, oh, yeah, I want all these things to magically come together. Um, you know, having a graph representation makes it a lot easier for you to represent all that information. So this goes back to the discussion we've had before on the crawl, walk, run, right? Um, so when you think about graphs, people immediately are, are, are knowledge graphs and stuff. They're thinking about, oh, I need to have a graph database. I need to get my data into the graph. And I see stuff that people literally just dump CSV files into a graph database. And then voila, my data is in a graph. And somehow it magically, I could go solve a lot of problems. No, that's like basically dumping a data into a lake. Like you are not solving any problem by doing that. So please stop doing that if you're doing, if, if you are. Um, so, but now it, it seems that it seems in a way people want to go just jump again into the deep end and go do stuff with graphs. And if we think about this, this may now, it may, it may sound boring. It may, it's not sexy, but this is the way how we believe, this is our point of view. Right? And frankly, what I've been looking at for so long is crawl, walk, and run. Let's look at our metadata first. And if you think about it, your metadata is a graph or you should represent, you should, you, Forget about a graph. Your metadata, you want to be able to capture all your metadata and how all your metadata happens to be connected. Guess what? You represent that as a graph. So our, our, our real world business concepts and relationships here, we're not talking about a customer or an order. We're talking about what is a table? What is a column? What are, what, what are our, our, our analysts? What are our dashboards, right? Uh, um, what are our business glossaries, right? Those are parts of our metadata. Who are our people? Our people are stewards. Who's an owner of a database? Who is an owner of the subset of the table? Uh, this is a column. This column is derived from this other calcul other table. And there was a, a query that, that, that represented this type of transformation. This column represents a calculation. Oh, the, so a calculation itself is a concept in the graph. And so this is really, I think, your first step if you think about it. Your first knowledge graph, honestly, I think should be a knowledge graph of your metadata. And that's how you start connecting things all together. That's how you know what's out there. That's how you can go. I mean, lineage itself is a graph, right? And, th and th that's the type of stuff that we do is that when we go figure out, uh, we go crawl stored procedures. I mean, stuff that we do with Manta and, and go get, uh, go crawl ETL tools. Like when we get all that information, that happens to be represented as a graph. And that's how we're able to go trace all the lineage. And then you can go, you want to go do really advanced stuff and figure out all the people that have used this column for this dashboard over the last amount of time. That's all data that's connected. And what's the better, best way of doing this than representing it as a graph? I think for us, that's kind of the key idea why your catalog of data, your data catalog should be basically powered by a knowledge graph. Um, and if it's not, because everything I just said, you can say, oh, I can just, I can create a relational database to go do that. Like, yes, of course you can. But that means that you are, you are in this rigid framework. And I think that's the other thing we need to go think about, which is the real big advantage of, of, of cataloging all your metadata and representing the graph is that today, you know what you're cataloging. Today, you know what data you have, or at least you think you know what data you have. Tomorrow, God knows what type of data is going to be around there. And so if you create your scheme, you, you create your, your data catalog or you work with the data catalog that's so rigid, you can only catalog the stuff that we support today. How do you know that you're able to be nimble and agile and flexible to go be able to bring in and catalog the metadata that's going to show up tomorrow? I think that's really, really important that we have to go think about. And this is really to build your foundation. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the flexibility is a huge aspect here. And I think that, um, you know, uh, one example that even I know that we're experiencing in real time right now at data.world is, you know, one of the things that people are asking us is like, hey, can you model um, APIs, right? Because we have APIs that we want to bring into the catalog and, uh, and maybe they're like data, data access APIs, right? Um, and, and normally that kind of a thing coming along, whether it was to our customers or to us as a company, um, would be like, oh God, now we have to completely rethink our data model. We have to change the way that we're representing all these things. But, um, but actually because of the, because of the graph model, it becomes very easy for us to say like, oh, okay, well, tables and columns, that's a, a type of data, right? Those are different data structure representations. Um, and, uh, you know, an API endpoint also might be sort of a, a, a representation, right? And maybe that's sort of at the same level as a table, right? And then you've got, you know, tables have columns. 
and uh, API uh, endpoints both have properties, right? And so that's just one sort of an example of how this flexibility can kind of come into uh, into play and 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 allow you to you know not kind of future proof what you're doing. Well, uh, so I'm seeing Don here asking a question: why, why graph databases were regarded as a failure due to inflexibility as business needs change with relational as a solution? Why are they coming back now? So, I mean, I I, I would argue. This is a touchy subject about if you look at the if I I look at history right and I've been I've been studying a lot of the history uh, of of knowledge graphs specifically going back to like the 50s. Um, so we we what we see is an original kind of in the 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 network world right when you have IDS right? Charlie Bachman comes up with IDS and things were very tightly coupled. So you needed to be able so you had a structure of data which happened to be the graph and you had to go right basically go query your data, you basically had to write a program that knew the structure of your data. And guess what? Your structures changes because requirements change, you, your program that access the data broke. So you needed to go update that again. So then that was so, it, was, it wasn't nimble at all. You, it was very tightly coupled. So the whole idea of the relational model that, that COD comes up with is saying, wait, we need to have this term called data independence. That I wanna be able to go separate the way and, and, and he actually thought about it from a mathematical point of view. I want to be able to think about sets, right? And that's what a relation is. A relation is, 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 is a set of things. A relation is like a table. And I, I'm seeing a set A and I'm seeing a set B. And then what you want to go do is like, oh, I want to be able to find the intersection between A and B. And guess what? That's what the join is, right? So they start doing this and then he starts decoupling kind of this this mathematical abstraction based on sets from the physical abstraction of data. So when you say A join B, you never say, oh, it has to be A, which I'm gonna to join to B. You, you don't say that because it could be B join to A and you don't know what join algorithm is gonna be happening. It could be a merge join, it could be a hash join. It all so when you write queries in SQL, it's at a higher level abstraction and that's why you have to have compilers and optimizations and so forth. So you have this, this separation. Now, what happens really interesting is that this is all in the 70s, right? And then the 80s come along and you would argue that the, the, a, lot, a lot of people are saying, well, you can't solve everything with relational, right? People are kind of being skeptical about things. And then you, what, comes out in the, what comes out during this time is object-oriented programming languages. So then they say, wait, I have to write code where I'm creating objects, but I'm, my data is being persisted in this other thing called a relational database. So now I need to go take my programming language, which is in terms of objects, and they need to go change it into a query and go do this. And they said, no, why can't I just go query an object and that object as is persistent? And this gives a rise to object-oriented databases, right? This happened all during the 80s. And a lot of the work on graph databases kind of early on, more academic came up during that time. But the whole point was that it got too separated. People said, let's go start bringing them back together. We can have so many discussions on why object-oriented databases failed and stuff, but they basically are not around anymore, or they're very, very specific uh, uh, to very specific type of, uh, of scenarios. Um, so relational databases, right? You have or I mean, yeah, Sybase at that time came up in Oracle and SQL Server, all these things. They just became a gigantic market about that. And then what I would think is that the the over time the graph the graph uh, theory and the graph systems have been maturing to the point that we say what happened during the, the, the 2000s was all the big data and the NoSQL revolution of being schemaless. And that's where graphs came in again, right? Being document stores starting out like MongoDB and then you want to have graphs. It's just another natural data model that came back. So out of that one is, that, that's the language that, that's kind of the data model that's come back also specifically because you have query languages and also because of all the semantic web work that happened all throughout the 2000s that gave you a standardized graph data model and a query language. So I think it's just, it's, it's not a particular, like it, it, there's so many pieces in history that have occurred for us to the graphs to come back in. But bottom line, a graph data model is just flexible. It's just very nimble. Like I, I, I can just add an edge to the graph and my data continues, my database system continues to work. I don't need to go to find a schema beforehand and so forth, which that's a good thing and also a bad thing. That's why you need to, um, so you still need to have schemas around, I believe. Uh, there's situations where you don't need schemas, but you can still have schemas with graphs. Hold on, I, so I've been ranting for a while. I don't know, what do you think? 
No, I think that's, I think that's good. I think, you know, I think what's interesting is it's, it's sometimes the history provides a lot of context on how we kind of got to where we are today. And, you know, I actually think that, you know, your, your response around sort of the structured and the schema versus the schema list, I think that actually connects a little bit to a question that uh, another person had around, you know, what about like fast changing metadata where, you know, uh, the, the information may be changing shape pretty often, you know, think like real time data, document data, stream data, things like that. You know, um, I'm curious what you think, Juan. I'll, the first thing I'll add is that, you know, I think that one of the nice things about taking a graph representation and, and there's ways to do this in a, in a, in a structured uh, representation, right? And we know some tools that do this, but it's especially easier in a, in a graph representation is, is this concept of sort of a generic object model, right? Where information is getting crawled and being collected. And, uh, and at first you're kind of collecting it all and you're kind of saying, okay, this is a, a generic analysis component or a generic uh, data component. Uh, and then uh, as you're bringing this data in, you start to realize, oh, interesting, either I need to model this at a higher level and I need to kind of think of this as like a blob and I'm just gonna let this information be a blob, right? And then I'll kind of, I'm gonna process it later down the line. Um, or you say, hey, actually, you know, this, this information makes sense to kind of call, you know, properties or fields or slot it into sort of the metadata model in a more specific way uh, and then model it later, right? And so the idea of being able to sort of model it later and that being a first class citizen in the underlying system as opposed to, you know, more complex layers of abstraction that maybe is going to require a join or many joins in most cases to kind of make come to fruition um, is, uh, is nice, right? Yeah, so so this is something that that we built. I mean, within Data World, we built it this way, uh, and it's built on a lot of open standards on just representing data sets and stuff like that. So we internally, so we have our own schema, mo our own model to represent any type of metadata. We call it DWEC, the Data World Enterprise Catalog Ontology, basically. But this stuff is built. We didn't invent it. We built it. Uh, based on a bunch of open existing standards. So, for example, DCAT. DCAT is a very is is an, is an a very standard uh, vocabulary to represent data sets. And then you have Dublin Core, which is something around there. Uh, then you have FOF, which is friend of a friend to help to define relationships between people. Uh, you have Pravo, which is a way to represent the provenance, uh, which is stuff that we use to represent lineage. Um, so you have a bunch of these things that we start putting together. And, the, and then basically you say, well, there's there's an asset, right? There's this thing that we're gonna go catalog. And this asset can be a table, which belongs to a database. It can be a column, which is which is connected to a table, which belongs to a database. There can be an analysis. Analysis can be a, oh, we, we'll make it very specific. A Tableau dashboard is a type of analysis. A, a Power BI dashboard is, is, is one and so forth, right? You, and then you have, uh, oh, you also have SCAS, right? The, the, the simple knowledge organizational system, right? That's basically the standard to go represent taxonomies. So you start, there's already all these standard ways to go represent a lot of the metadata. And that helps you to be very flexible. And then you can say, look, either something that I'm cataloging exists in my, because I'm cataloging a table. So I'm going to say, hey, this thing I just cataloged in my graph, I'm just going to say it's a table or it's something new. And I'm saying, you know what? We don't know what it is yet. And that's probably happening to the stuff that we're doing with like APIs. Like it's really unclear, but we can go start bringing all this data in and then people can start accessing that data and querying it. And it allows us to be very flexible because otherwise, if you're, if you're going to go, uh, you're going to go define a, 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 a relational schema to bring it, to go manage all the metadata you're bringing in, you got to come up with all these schemas. I mean, def define it, which is you don't even know what these things are yet, right? Tomorrow, we don't know what system is out there that we want to go classify. I mean, like we 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 have a new crawler for for AWS Glue. So, I mean, that took us that was pretty quick for us to go generate these things, and it's because we just know how to. We have a we have a model that allows us to bring in any type of data. I would. I would, I, I think people wouldn't sleep if we were building a data catalog built on just kind of traditional relational databases. I literally think that uh, people would be going crazy internally. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, a, it's easy to, uh, to sometimes not even realize how much easier we have it uh, because of the, uh, the graph approach that we're taking. And I think Glue is a good example where, you know, we were starting to pull in these lambda transformations, right? And we're like, okay, how do we want to represent these lambdas, right? And we're like, oh, okay, we're going to call it an activity, right? Uh, and we're like, okay, and what about the lineage of, you know, one 
sort of uh, land a job interacting with that data and then writing it to another data, right? Okay, cool. We'll just write that into Pravo, right? And, and it just makes it so easy in terms of like being able to accommodate those kinds of things. Yeah. And then, so I, I know it's interesting that this, we've, we've got like five minutes left before we're going to, we'll open this up to everybody else, but I find it interesting that we've just had this discussion around metadata, right? We haven't talked about yet, oh, I'm actually representing data about customers and orders and, and, and stuff like that to go do interesting graph analytics. That's just naturally the next step. But I mean, within your organization, you want to be able to organize all the data you have as your first step, right? That's your crawling. Let's get our metadata organized. And we generally believe that the best way to go do this is to go do this as a graph. Now, as you, I mean, I, I well, let me just stop being a salesperson here about data.world because I, yeah, that's not my intention here. Go look at other people who have done this. And, uh, and I'll actually put some links. So we, when we started, when I personally started looking into a little bit kind of like the history of data catalogs, you look at the first, the first tools that came out that were data catalogs or didn't, they didn't call themselves data catalogs at that time, but it's like folks at Airbnb, right? Uh, or for, folks at Lyft uh, and folks at LinkedIn, they were creating, I mean, they all had this idea that they needed to go democratize data. We need to be able to give people the ability to go uh, find their data and so forth. That's the ultimate premise. And they built something which now is considered a data catalog. Guess what they built it on? They all built it on different graph technologies. Let it be, let it be that because they built, they used an existing graph database. I think uh, other people, they, 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 they implemented a graph approach within a relational database, right? So again, I'm not saying that graph that, that relational databases are gonna go away or whatever. No, no, I'm not saying that at all. It's just the graph model that you wanna go think about it because it, it, it enables them to be very, 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 very flexible about that. And actually, oh, I, I had a quote here that I, that I, that I really liked. And this is from one of the, the articles I saw at Airbnb. They said, a graph of the ecosystem has value far beyond tracking lineage and cross-functional information. Data is a proxy for the operations of a company. Analyzing the network helps to surface lines of communication and identify facets or disconnected information. So if you're really trying to understand how your business works, you want to track how who is using what and for what. And guess what? That's, that's just a question about how things are related. Might as well represent that all kind of in a graph model. Yeah. Oh, thanks for posting yeah, those I, links there, Tim. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, as you mentioned that, I wanted to get that in there. And, you know, I really love this progression that you talk about where, you know, at first it's about creating that first knowledge graph around your metadata, right? And then as you bring in knowledge graphs, knowledge graphs around data itself, now it fits into already a structured framework where you have sort of metadata about your metadata, you have metadata about your data, all these things triangulate together uh, and create uh, sensibility around your data, not just human sensibility or human sort of UI that can kind of, kind of, which is your catalog around that, but also um, machine readability around it, right? So that as you think about, you know, what the crawl, crawl, walk, run is, right? In the future, you want to do more advanced things around NLP, around AI, automation, different things. That when your data is all part, you know, your metadata and your data is part of that knowledge graph. Now that that run aspect, which I think for most companies isn't really within reach right now, really starts to become more uh, realistic. Yeah, and 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 so here's a, the transition from the from the crawl to the to the walk is within your knowledge graph of your metadata, you start representing your business glossary, your vocabulary. And guess what? Those terms there start to become the real world objects that your business folks talk about. What is an, you start to find what is an order. You start to find what is a customer. What is, what is a product? Your are different product categories. And then later on you say, wait, I now want to represent my data in terms of this business view, which is, happens to be also represented as a graph. And you say, okay, where's the customer information? Or you realize there's multiple ways of customers. Where's my order information? And then you start connecting that, again, more connections, the concept of an order back to where your data is. And you realize, oh, an order is everything that's in this table that has, I mean, it's everything where order, everything from the table called order where is active equals one and whatever, right? That's your mapping. And then you start adding more kind of the, adding the semantic layer on top of that. Uh, 
and then we go start getting into the really fancy stuff of having meaningful data represented that business people can understand. And then you can go off to really cool graph analytics that people go do for recommendations, for fraud detection, all that stuff that you're seeing out there. But if you're just going to jump into the deep end, I'm seeing people are 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 are, are treading water unsafely and there it, there's just so much risk and i think you really want to build your foundation little by little um anyways i think we're at this hour at, at half the hour and, and and it's so cool to see so many people around so uh any final parting thoughts there tim no just that um you know thanks everyone for joining this part of the conversation now uh, in a second here we'll transition to more of an open um uh, open conversation. We can talk about, you know, metadata as your first knowledge graph or other questions or topics that might be in, of interest. And uh, a quick shout out to uh, next week. Next week, we'll actually have um, a special guest, uh, Ernie Ostick, who's actually on right now. He's a regular of uh, Catalog and Cocktails, uh, uh, product, uh, head of product over at uh, Manta. Uh, and we'll be talking about uh, data, li data lineage. And, the, and the, we actually have a webinar coming up uh, tomorrow, uh, if anybody wants to join that. Um, we'll post a link here in a second. Uh, you can join us in the webinar tomorrow, and then we'll have a catalog and cocktails conversation next week. So it should be a lot of fun. Well, thanks, everybody, for coming, and, and uh, we'll see you. Stay around for the after party.